Support for this grassroots community television program comes from U.S. Trust. From wealth structuring to investment management, U.S. Trust's global perspective, unique team approach, fiduciary platform, and more than 200 years of experience provide for the kind of insights, solutions, and expertise that have a worth all their own. Um, summer public lecture. Um, my name is Martin Schmaltz. I'm a physicist. I am currently visiting the Aspen Center for Physics. Uh, I'm also a member of the Aspen Center for Physics, uh, which means that I help run that place. And uh, But my normal, my day job is that I'm a professor of theoretical physics at Boston University. So I only get to visit here a few weeks every summer, and I really, really love it here. I love the community, I love the center, and so it's a great honor to be here and to introduce one of our members um, to you uh, in a minute. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Aspen Center for Physics. So it's a um, really special place for us theoretical physicists um, every summer, over 15 weeks, about 500 of us come from all over the world to this center here to spend something between three, four, five weeks to um, talk, to find our colleagues here, to talk with them about the latest developments, the newest research, uh, to generate new ideas, to start new research projects. For me personally, it's been an enormous um, uh, uh, help in my research. A lot of my ideas, the ones that I'm the most proud of, have been started here in conversations with colleagues. So the center is very special to all of us, and uh, and we're very happy that we have to that we get to have it in such a wonderful environment here in Aspen and in such a wonderful community. Um, so we're very grateful for all of you to to have us here. Um, before I get to introduce today's speaker, I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about uh, next week's program. So next week on Thursday at 5.30, we have a, a lecture by Joe Polchinski from the University uh, of California in Santa Barbara. Uh, he will ta talk about space-time versus the quantum. If you don't know exactly what that means, uh, I don't either. <laughs> But it sounds pretty cool. I think it's going to be good. He's a very good lecturer. So that lecture is not here, but it's on the campus of the Aspen Center for Physics in the Fluke Forum at 5.30. Uh, it's also listed in the program. I'm also supposed to tell you that if you would like to be added to our mailing list, there are sign-up sheets outside. Uh, so please do sign up there if you want to. And now let me get to today's speaker. So today's speaker is Joe Licken. Uh, he will speak about neutrinos. Uh, Joe uh, got his bachelor's degree from, um, you know, we work with these kinds of notepads, and I don't know, somehow they're always on the wrong page. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota, uh, his PhD from MIT, and he is now at the Fermi National Accelerator Lab, that is the premier particle physics laboratory in this country. Uh, outside of Chicago, and he just became the deputy director of that laboratory, um, which is a huge job. Um, he is also an APS fellow and a fellow of the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences and has lots and lots and lots of other honors. Uh, I asked him which one to point out the most, and he said, well, actually, I'm not very honorable at all, so I, I don't know what to say. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, yes, he's also um, been involved in several NOVA productions on TV. Uh, he has multiple articles in the New York Times. One of them has the wonderful quote about the Higgs boson that we've just discovered, the big toe of God. But today, he's only going to be talking about little things, the neutrinos. So please welcome Joe Licken. 
Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, it's great to be back in Aspen. It's one of my favorite places in the whole world, and it's good to be back at the Aspen Center for Physics, if only for a couple days. It's one of the, the best uh, theory institutes in the world, so it's, it's great to be here. Uh, before I get started, I just want to make a dedication. I want to dedicate uh, tonight's uh, neutrino talk to uh, Marty Flug, who's here in the audience, who loves neutrinos even more than I do, if such a thing is possible. And in fact, I kind of had Marty in the back of my head when I was putting these slides together. So we'll see, we'll see if I did a good job on that. Uh, this is a physics lecture, so I'm going to start out but with an exercise in poetry. Uh, you, might, you might have read this poem at some place. It's kind of a famous poem. It's by Don Updike, who's probably better known as a novelist. It was published in The New Yorker in 1960. The name of the poem is Cosmic Gall, and I have edited it a bit. Uh, in order to fit on one slide, but these are the good parts. So let me just read it to you. Neutrinos, they are very small. They have no charge and have no mass and do not interact at all. The Earth is just a silly ball to them through which they simply pass. They snub the most exquisite gas, ignore the most substantial wall, and scorning barriers of class infiltrate you and me. Like tall and painless guillotines, they fall down through our heads into the grass. So let's deconstruct that uh, poem for a minute. So first of all, in 1960, he was absolutely right. All the physicists would have told him neutrinos have no mass. But of course, part of the story of tonight's lecture is that they do have masses. It's just that they're teeny, teeny, tiny masses. And that's one of the things we're trying to understand is why they have masses less than a millionth the mass of the next heavier particle, which is the familiar electron. So OK, got that wrong, but that was not his fault. Um, this is poetic license, I think. Uh, he says they do not interact at all. Uh, at, in 1960, we knew that they do interact. We'd actually detected them, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, but they interact very, very weakly with ordinary matter. Uh, passing through the Earth, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, uh, there are lots of neutrinos passing through the Earth. Uh, some of them interact with the Earth. There's about a one in a billion chance for the standard neutrinos passing through the Earth that they will actually interact. So that wasn't too bad. Infiltrate you and me, that is certainly true. You have about a, neutri a trillion neutrinos per second passing through your body right now, whether you like it or not. Uh, that's what's happening. But they are pretty painless, um, not too much to worry about. In fact, in your entire lifetime, even though it's a trillion per second, the chance that even one of them will interact with your body is about 25%. So probably not too much to worry about. OK, so that's our poetry exercise. Uh, this is a little more of a physics-y thing. So elementary particles come in different flavors. Uh, neutrinos are, are no exception. They, there's at least three different flavors of neutrino. And when I say flavor here, as you'll see, that kind of has to do with the fact that they're related to other particles. There's one that's related to the ordinary electron, and then there's one that's related to a relative of the electron called the muon and another that's related to another relative of the electron called the tau lepton. So that's one thing about neutrinos is there's several of them. Uh, they don't have any charge, as I said. They interact only very weakly with ordinary matter, and they have teeny tiny masses. OK. Where do neutrinos come from? Uh, well, they come from lots of places. They come from the sun. Uh, the nuclear fusion reactions that power the sun also produce neutrinos. Uh, this is the, the first step in that, in making the sun shine is you actually take two protons. You know, the sun is mostly hydrogen gas, which is protons, basically. And you fuse them to make something called deuterium. But deuterium is actually not two protons. It's a proton and a neutron. So the trick in, the, in making the sunshine is you somehow have to convert one of these protons into a different particle, the neutron. And it's that process that produces both this charged particle, which is that positron, and the neutrino. So this is what makes the first step in make, making the sun shine. It's actually kind of hard to do this. This is something we can't do in the laboratory. It's that difficult, um, this first step of uh, fusion. But uh, it's something that uh, it sort of sets the rate at which the sun shines, which is a good thing for us, because this is the reason why it takes billions of years uh, for the sun to uh, burn itself out instead of doing it in, say, a million years. There's more complicated fusion in the sun, and I'll get to one of these uh, later on. You make lots of different uh, heavier elements in the sun, and one of them that you make is unstable. It's called boron-8, and after you make it inside the sun, it actually decays, and its decay is another way of making neutrinos. Okay, so neutrinos from the sun. What about Big Bang? Big Bang made lots of stuff. 
uh, including us, and it produced lots and lots of neutrinos. In fact, there's about 10 million neutrinos left over from the Big Bang in every cubic foot of space. And in fact, if you do the counting, we believe that neutrinos are by far the most prevalent form of known matter in the universe. There's maybe a billion times more neutrinos out there. If you counted up everything in the universe, you'd find there's a billion times more neutrinos than there are electrons and protons and neutrons and the things that you're made out of. So that's an awful lot of neutrinos. Where else do they come from? They also come from cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are other kinds of high energy particles that come in from space and they hit something in the Earth's atmosphere, high up in the atmosphere, and produce other stuff. And some of the other stuff they make is neutrinos. And you've got about 10 of those atmospheric neutrinos passing every second through just your thumbnail, so some larger number through your body. Supernova produce neutrinos. Here's an example of a supernova. It's an exploding star. When it turns out that when these stars explode, they not only produce neutrinos, that's most of what they produce. Most of the energy carried off by standard supernovas is actually carried off by neutrinos, and I'll also get back to that later on in this talk. Neutrinos are produced by nuclear reactors. So depending on where you live, how close you live to a nuclear reactor, uh, you may have as many as a million neutrinos from nuclear reactors passing through your same thumbnail per second. Uh, so that's also a lot. The Earth's crust produces neutrinos, and it's for the reason that there's radioactive stuff in the Earth's crust. And that produces neutrinos when it decays, and it also produces energy in the form of heat. And that heat is what causes things like volcanoes and earthquakes. So the same process that makes volcanoes also makes lots of neutrinos. And in fact, it's interesting for us to try to figure out if we can detect those neutrinos produced inside the Earth. Last but not least, uh, one of the most interesting sources of neutrinos is bananas. <laughs> <coughs> bananas are a source of neutrinos. Well, uh, we're in Aspen, so you eat healthy, you understand that bananas are good because they contain potassium. But potassium has an isotope called potassium-40 that's radioactive, and when it decays, that radioactive decay is a source of neutrinos, which means that if you eat bananas, you are also yourself a source of neutrinos on approximately one million per day. So you are neutrino sources. We may find a use for you at some point at Fermilab. So neutrinos, this is just to sort of summarize before I get into the more physics stuff, why we love neutrinos. So what did, what, from what I just told you, you can see that they're really key actors in very important physical processes here on the Earth and out there in the universe. They're everywhere. They're connected to everything, as we'll see. They're connected to all kinds of other questions in particle physics. They are weird. They're the oddballs of elementary particles, which is saying a lot because there's lots of weird elementary particles, but neutrinos are the weirdest ones and they're the ones about which we know probably the least next to the Higgs boson, which we only just discovered. And in fact, if you're the kind of person like I am that gets drafted to sit on committees, we make lists of things like science drivers have to give to the government to say this is how we want to spend our money, and we just finish an exercise like that where we had neutrinos in our top five lists of, we think, of the most interesting things to do. Okay. So I hope that's enough motivation to get you through another 50 minutes of neutrinos. Let me go back now to a little history of where neutrinos came from. Neutrinos are an example of something that were thought up in the mind of a crazy theorist a long time before they were actually seen in nature. And in this particular case, the crazy theorist was Wolfgang Pauli, who was a very smart guy. And he invented them trying to solve a problem which was considered a very big problem at the time, so this is 1930, which is that they knew about radioactivity and they knew there was different kinds of radioactivity in particular, there was this a process called beta decay, and here's a simple example. This is carbon-14, the same carbon-14 they use for, for dating, and it decays into nitrogen and an electron, and they looked at this process, and you figure out what's the energy and momentum of the things that you're producing here, and you apply energy conservation, and you see that it's not working. And this was not understood at all. Nowadays, we would actually uh, write this as a more simple process, we would actually say what's really going on here is that there's a neutron inside the carbon nucleus and it's turning into a proton and an electron. But it doesn't matter, any way you slice it, there's a problem there if you look at it this way. And in fact, Niels Bohr, who was a very famous physicist, he said, well, maybe the problem is that energy isn't conserved. Maybe in quantum mechanics, energy is only sort of conserved on the average or something. So that's a kind of a desperate thing for a famous physicist to say. But Pauli had a, a different solution, here you see him puzzling with another smart guy over this, I don't know if it's over this issue or some other issue. But Pauli's idea was expressed in this famous letter that he wrote to 
a gathering of physicists that he was not able to attend because he was going to a party instead, which shows that he had his priorities straight. But in this, in this uh, very, he had a very bad typewriter, typewriter, but if you can read the first line here, it says, Liba radioactiva dominun heron, view radioactive ladies and gentlemen, and then he goes on to propose that the problem with beta decay, this nuclear beta decay, is because there was a particle that you don't know about that was produced, uh, which he actually called the neutron, but I won't call it the neutron because that's what this guy is supposed to be. Um, but he said there's some other particle that you don't see because it's, it doesn't have any charge that's produced along with these other two particles, and that's the way that energy conservation works. So that was his basic idea. Uh, he was a professor in Zurich, and I took this picture in Zurich in May, and I think it's a nice picture, so that's why I put it there. Uh, and he sent this letter explaining what we now know is the correct answer to this problem. In fact, nowadays, we would have a more even more complicated answer than this. We would say, well, actually, the neutron is made out of quarks, and there's these different three quarks inside the neutron, and it turns into a proton, and then it's actually one of the quarks that changes from a, what's called a down quark to an up quark, and that involves the weak interaction, which involves this weak force particle, and it's that thing, actually, that produces uh, the neutrino in the end. But it doesn't matter. He basically had the right answer. However, he wasn't too happy about this, and in fact, he was quoted as saying, I've done a terrible thing. I've postulated a particle that can't be detected. And it is kind of a terrible thing, because if you solve a problem by, if you're a physicist and you solve a problem by saying, oh, the problem is solved by something you can never see, uh, that doesn't really sound like science. So this bothered him. And in fact, he didn't publish this idea. He, the, the letter was the only published uh, record of this for some years after that. However, other physicists took this idea seriously. And in particular, Enrico Fermi, who now has a laboratory named after him, was a very smart guy. And after the actual neutron was discovered in 1932, he understood very clearly what was going on here in nuclear beta decay. And he said, well, there must be some new weak, new weak interaction, he called it, that we don't understand that involves neutrons, protons, electrons, and Pauli's invisible particle. And since the, the name neutron had already been taken, he said, let's call the new invisible particle the neutrino because to an Italian that sounds like a good name for it. It is a good name, I think. So he coined the name, and he sent this brilliant paper, which in fact is the correct theory of the way these weak interactions look at the energies that they could probe in those days. So he had the correct explanation, and he had the good name. It was the, one of the most brilliant papers anybody ever wrote. So he sent it to the, the journal Nature, which is where you send the really good papers. And of course, they rejected it. And they said, uh, this paper, we're not going to publish this paper because it contains speculations too remote from reality. In particular, these neutrinos that nobody's ever going to see. So that was kind of discouraging to Fermi. And in fact, it was one of the things that pushed him to start doing experiments instead of writing theory papers, which actually turned out to be a good thing for everybody. Now, in fact, one of the things in this paper that's interesting is that he understood immediately that if this could happen, this is the nuclear beta decay, where the neutron turns into a proton and electron and the neutrino, then there's another process that also has to happen where the neutrino can interact with a proton like you would have a normal material and produce a neutron and the antiparticle of an electron, which is called the positron. And this had just been discovered, so he knew that these things existed. And so he said, well, actually, if you have enough of these neutrinos, you can actually detect them by looking for this process because presumably producing positrons is kind of an unusual thing to do. And so even if they, the neutrinos don't interact very much with matter, you could eventually figure out that they were there. And that indeed was a correct idea. However, it took uh, 20 years before this was verified. And it was verified in 1956 by these two gentlemen, Fred Reines and Clyde Cowan. They were physicists at the Los Alamos Laboratory. And they were thinking to themselves, well, this is a good idea, but you need a really good source of neutrinos. What's a really good source of neutrinos? And their first idea was, well, we're at Los Alamos. We have nuclear weapons. We can do nuclear test explosions, stick a neutrino detector next to it, and see if we see any neutrinos coming out. So they actually designed an experiment to do that. But eventually, they decided maybe that wasn't such a great idea. And they came up with a better idea, which was to take the same kind of detector, which they called poltergeist, and to stick it next to a nuclear reactor. Um, actually, the first reactor they stuck it next to, it, it didn't work. But the second time, they were lucky. This is the Savannah Rivers in South Carolina. And they were actually able to see this process, the process of the 
positron and the positron and prove that these neutrinos were really there and are really particles. And uh, Fred uh, Linus won the Nobel Prize for this. Uh, Clyde Cowan didn't actually live long enough to share in the prize. So now we shift a few more years, 1962. These three gentlemen were the first to show that there's more than one kind of neutrino. And it wasn't too surprising because people knew, again, as I was saying, that the electron has these relatives, like the muon and the tau. Uh, the tau wasn't known then, but the muon was. So it wasn't too crazy to think that maybe there was a neutrino that went with the muon. And indeed, these guys showed that there was, and they also got a Nobel Prize. See how easy it is to get a Nobel Prize? <laughs> By showing there's two neutrinos. Uh, this uh, person here, Leon Letterman, he later became director of Fermilab and made uh, some other discoveries, uh, big discoveries of particle physics, was really one of the real giants of our field. And then, okay, I got two neutrinos, there should be a third one. And indeed there was, and that actually took until the year 2000, and it was discovered at Fermilab, the third type of neutrino that goes along with this third type of, uh, this, it's the second relative in this, the third type of charged particle that's like an electron called the tau. And by this time we're in, in sort of the modern era of particle physics, and so now experiments are not done by two people or three people, they're done by however many people are in this picture. Uh, you get larger and larger collaborations because you're doing larger and larger, more difficult experiments. So this is the donut collaboration that made this discovery. And unfortunately, the Nobel Committee doesn't know how to handle collaborations, so these people didn't get a Nobel Prize. Uh, all they got was their picture taken for this. And they ended up as a question on Jeopardy, which is a, a, a kind of immortality. <laughs> it's not quite the same as a Nobel Prize. All right, so that sort of brings, brings us up more or less to uh, what I was saying about neutrinos uh, having weird properties. I want to get a little more into those weird properties now. Uh, we know there's three flavors defined by the electron, muon, and tau that goes along with them, so I know what flavor means. And the theorists originally said neutrinos have no mass. That turned out to be wrong, and we'll, we'll see uh, how this works in a minute. The next simplest thing you would have guessed is that, well, okay, probably, this, if they have mass, this will be the light one because the electron is the lightest of these three particles and this will be the heavy one because this is the heaviest of those three particles. That was also wrong. So it, this is sort of the history of neutrinos is that the theorists, sort of after Pauli and, and, Fermi, and uh, Fermi, all of the theorists have been wrong about everything when it comes to neutrinos. <laughs> but this turned out to be kind of a complicated story because it has to do with this phenomenon of neutrino oscillations. So let me talk a little about that. So that story begins in a gold mine called the Homestake Mine, which is in Leed, it's not Lead, Leed, South Dakota. Leed is some kind of mining town. Uh, this is one of the shafts that goes down. It's a very, very deep mine. It goes down a mile underground. It's in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And what was happening in that mine? Well, it, back in the 1940s, there was an Italian physicist named Ponte Corvo who had what he thought was a brilliant idea, which uh, to actually not only detect neutrinos, but count them. And his brilliant idea was, if you take a tank of dry cleaning fluid, which contains a lot of chlorine, and you shine neutrinos on it, that could come from the sun or whatever neutrino source he has, uh, eventually some of them will actually produce argon, which is an inert element. Uh, and uh, eventually, if you're really good at chemistry, you could actually separate, separate out the argon atoms you have produced in your dry cleaning fluid and count the number of neutrinos that have interacted uh, with your tank of uh, fluid. So that was his brilliant idea. He told his brilliant idea to Fermi, who said that will never work. And so he also never published uh, his idea, but it was sort of out there in the physics world. And in fact, in the 1960s, Ray Davis, who was trained as a chemist, said, well, that doesn't sound so hard. I bet I could actually do that. So he got some money together to put a tank, here's the tank down in the Homestake mine, uh, to see if he could count neutrinos coming from the sun. Why did he put it in the Homestake mine? Well, if you don't put it in the Homestake mine, if you stick it, say, in the surface of the Earth, uh, you're gonna be overwhelmed by those cosmic rays I was talking about, all the radiation um, from that. So he put it down in the mine in order that the, almost the only thing that uh, you're gonna see down there is interactions from neutrinos. So he put it down there in the 1960s and he waited, and he waited through the 1970s, and he waited through the 1980s, uh, counting neutrinos. Well, in order for this to be interesting, you have to know how many neutrinos you expect to see coming from the sun. And there was a theorist named John Bacall who had done that calculation, and that has to do with the, getting the nuclear fusion right inside the sun, which is a pretty hard problem if you, if you think about it. 
but he claimed that he had done that, and he claimed that Davis's experiment should see 36 solar neutrinos per month uh, coming basically from that boron-8 fusion interaction and decay that I talked about before. But after 20 or 30 years, Davis had in fact only found about a third as many of those neutrinos as was expected. So you might have said this was a crisis in uh, the physics community, but it wasn't such a crisis as you might have thought because people assumed that either Davis had made a mistake in the experiment or McCall, McCall had made a mistake in understanding the solar physics, or maybe they both made a mistake. And so people didn't necessarily take this very seriously uh, until it was rather brilliantly and dramatically confirmed by two other more uh, expensive and powerful experiments, one in Japan, which I'll mention in a moment, and another in Sudbury, uh, Ontario, and Canada. And these experiments showed that, in fact, Davis was right, uh, that there is something that's happening to those solar neutrinos after they come out of the sun. And, and, and Davis uh, won a much-deserved Nobel Prize for being a real visionary on that. So what's the interpretation of that? You've got all these neutrinos that we know are coming out of the sun from fusion. They get to the Earth eight minutes later. And the ones that are produced in the sum, uh, sun are all electron neutrinos because the sun is, isn't hot enough to make any other kind of neutrino. It's just electrons there, just one of these other particles. But uh, the interpretation of this is that by the time they get to the Earth, um, they're a mixture. Some of them are electron neutrinos, but some of them have changed into muon neutrinos or tau neutrinos. So in some sense, it's like you started out with a chocolate ice cream cone, and by the time you get to the Earth, you've got three different flavors. So what does that mean? What is actually happening there? Well, the way we talk about this in physics is we say that the neutrinos oscillate. And what we say is that the thing that left the sun, the elect was electron neutrinos, okay, uh, but those electron neutrinos are actually a mixture of three different kinds of neutrinos with three different kinds of mass, three different values of mass. Uh, what does that mean to say it's a mixture? Well, that's something that doesn't make any sense in classical physics, but in quantum physics, you can actually talk about something being a mixture of different kinds of things. It's like Schrodinger's cat being a mixture of a dead cat and an alive cat. But this is with neutrinos. So another way of saying this is that if this idea is right, a neutrino that has a definite flavor doesn't really have a definite mass because it's a mixture of things with different mass. Or if you want a neutrino that has a definite mass, it won't have a definite flavor. So that's a very weird thing that happens in the, can happen in the quantum world that it can't happen in the classical world. Another way of saying this uh, in, in the quantum language is, you know, quantum mechanics says that particles are all, can also be thought about as waves. If you think about it in terms of waves, these three different flavors of neutrinos are, are like waves, but they have slightly different masses, which means the waves have slightly different frequencies. And if you add up waves that have slightly different frequencies, you get these kind of interference patterns. And if you think of this now as in, as in terms of time or, or distance, um, what you're going to see now is going to depend on where you look. If I look here, I may find that there's hardly any electron neutrinos at all, whereas if I look here, I'll find a lot more. And that's the basic interpretation of what Ray Davis found. He happened to be at the Earth and the sun distance. Uh, actually, it has more to do with the size of the sun. is just right so that uh, the number of neutrinos that he actually sees is about a third uh, electron neutrinos and two-thirds the other two kinds. So that's neutrino oscillation, a weird quantum thing. That's not the only kind of neutrino oscillation there is. Uh, I mentioned this Japanese experiment, which is called SuperK, which is for Super Kamiokanda. That's actually a, a, the biggest neutrino experiment that anybody's built so far. It's 50,000 tons of water inside of another mine, a mine, Kem the Kamioka mine in Japan. And uh, so this, this is the famous picture with the little boat, which you may have seen. Uh, normally this thing is filled all the way up, and these things here, these look like glass. Those are phototubes, they're very sensitive light detectors. So it's basically a 50,000 gallon, sorry, 50,000 ton uh, water tank, which is surrounded by very sensitive light detectors that look for the very occasional neutrino coming in that uh, leaves some energy inside this tank of water. So they discovered that not only was Ray Davis correct about the solar neutrinos, but that there's another kind of neutrino oscillation which has to do with the at atmospheric neutrinos that are produced by the sun. So there's actually two kinds of neutrino oscillations going on. And nowadays, we like to make pictures like this that show what that all means, uh, but in some sense, we're just expressing our ignorance. So we think that there are at least three kinds of neutrinos. So there's three different masses. So I'll call them nu1, nu2, nu3. Each of them is a mixture of flavors by some amount, and we're starting to measure what those amounts are, so that's progress. And then the, the reason there's two kinds of neutrino oscillations is that 
One of these differences of mass is responsible for one of the neutrino oscillations, the one that uh, we see with solar neutrinos, and the other one is responsible for the one that we see in atmospheric neutrinos from cosmic rays. Now, and this actually is kind of a funny thing because it's uh, the fact that these mass differences, which are very tiny amounts, very tiny mass differences, just ha happen to be just right that you'll have a problem with solar neutrinos and a problem with atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, it looks like nature was conspiring in order to make neutrino physics interesting. You could very easily have made these values such that we wouldn't have seen anything in the solar neutrinos and nothing in atmospheric neutrinos, and nobody would know there was any such thing as neutrino oscillations. So this is one of the many examples of nature seeming to be very kind to physicists. So that's expressing uh, something that we know. We don't actually know where zero is on that plot, so we don't know the overall scale of neutrinos except that it's small that it's, uh, again, as I said, less than a millionth, the, the actual masses are less than a millionth of the mass um, of an electron. So that's pretty light. I'm not gonna talk anymore about how we determine the actual masses of neutrinos. I'm gonna talk more about neutrino oscillations, but I just wanna let you know that there's two different ways you can actually measure what the overall mass scale is of neutrinos. One of them is to go back to this beta decay that was uh, what Pauli was originally interested in. It turns out if you do a really, really, really good job measuring beta decay, that's one way to measure, measure the actual mass of neutrino. The other way, which is much, much sexier, is to use cosmology and to use the fact that the mass of neutrinos actually affects the shape of the universe. It actually ex affects things like the distribution of galaxies that we see out in the universe. And this is a simulation, but it's, it's a computer simulation that gives you the idea of uh, what difference does it make whether neutrinos have, say, zero mass or they have some tiny mass. And the claim is that you actually get a different looking universe depending on, on how heavy neutrinos are uh, because they actually have the effect of, of smearing out. So here you see, look down here, this is a more smeared out distribution of matter which will eventually become galaxies and here you, say, you see it's less smeared out. <coughs> so these differences which you can see with your eye, at least in the simulation, are actually caused by what the mass of the neutrinos are, all those zillions of neutrinos that are out there in the universe. Okay, so now I wanna move on a little bit to the connections between the weird properties of neutrinos and other things, and, I, and if I were giving five lectures, I would get to all these bullet points, but I don't, so I'm just gonna talk about the first few. So one of the reasons why we're interested in neutrinos is because their masses are weird, but they're not the only kind of masses that are weird. Mass in general is something we don't understand, and something we're trying to understand, and the connection between neutrino masses and other kinds of uh, problems with mass in the Higgs boson is something that's very interesting. And then the other thing I'll actually get to here is the question of whether neutrinos are responsible for our existence. Uh, well, our existence requires many things to be true, but one of the things that requires to be true is that you live in a universe that has more matter than antimatter in it, and we apparently do live in such a universe, and we're trying to understand why that is. There are other really interesting questions that involve neutrinos that I could get to if I had more time. Um, if you go Google something like that, you can probably find more about that. So, excuse me for doing a Marco Rubio. Um, let me talk a little bit about mass in general. So we have this standard model of particle physics. We have all these particles. One of the weird things that we figured out is that particles don't naturally have mass. It's something that they acquire through some kind of dynamical process of interacting with something. And that's weird because that doesn't seem to be the case with other properties of particles. Particles have charge. They just have a charge. The charge is fixed. That's it. They have spin, which is a kind of intrinsic angular momentum. They have the spin, that's it, doesn't change. You don't have to explain it, it is what it is. This is not true of mass. Mass is the thing that they get through some kind of complicated dynamics that involves other kinds of interactions and force fields um, that give them mass. And this is one of the big things we're trying to figure out in particle physics. Well, one of the people that made a lot of progress on this was Professor Higgs here, where as he's explaining here at the Nobel ceremony, uh, there is an invisible force field that fills up the whole universe, sounds like a big, big assumption, and that is responsible for giving at least some of these particles their mass. And that was another crazy theorist idea that sat around for 40 years before it was verified, but it has now been ver verified by the fact that Mr. Higgs also said that this same invisible force field would produce Higgs boson particles that you could produce in really big colliders like the LHC. So that part of the mass story we're starting to understand but this part of the mass story is still a complete mystery. So these are supposed to be elementary particles of particle physics. And here I have made their size 
uh, according to their mass. Now, in fact, as far as we can tell, they don't actually have a size. So it's not really their size, but I'm, I'm, I'm drawing them in order to show you how different the masses are, the scale. So the top quark is the heaviest elementary particle. Its mass is about 400,000 times the mass of the electron. So you might think there should be an explanation for that, but nobody has any idea why that should be. And furthermore, as I said, the electron is a million times heavier than the neutrinos, which are so light that in this way of drawing it, you can't even really see them. And then there's all these other patterns with the other particles, the quarks, all these different kinds of quarks, and the electrons and neutrinos, it's all a big mess. So what is that telling us? Well, we don't know what this is telling us. Uh, to me, what this looks like is the periodic table of the elements before we understood atomic structure, right? It had lots of different things in it, all the different elements, and they had lots of complicated relationships. And what that was telling you was that you didn't understand the underlying structure and that when you figured that out, all of the structure would make sense. So I think the same thing is happening here with the particles that I was showing you, but this uh, is something that we still have to figure out. People have some ideas, but this is something that's still really terra incognita for particle physics. So what do you do when you don't understand something? Well, you sort of try everything you can think of, but one of the things you can do is look at the oddballs. And this is a conversation I've had with many of my colleagues, and there are people that are on different sides of this, so I want to sort of give you both sides. There's one group of physicists that says, well, wait a minute, we've been studying other particles like quarks for 50 years, and we've actually got a lot more data on them because they're easier to study than neutrinos. So we studied the hell out of the quarks, and we didn't figure out anything about why they have such weird masses and such weird properties. So now you tell me you want to study neutrinos and figure out something about the mass that way, but that's hopeless because neutrino masses probably involve all the stuff we didn't figure out about quarks and then an additional stuff that explains why they have such tidy masses. So it's a more complicated problem, not a less complicated problem, and that's a really stupid way to do physics. Okay, so my response to that is an analogy, and this is an, al an argument that you could have made along exactly these lines, circa 1900, and you would have made it to Madame Curie, who would have known that you were probably not right, but this is the other version of the argument going back to the periodic table. So we've studied the common elements like carbon and lead for 50 years and we still have no clue why there's such a variety of elements and why they have such different properties. So now you want to study radium. Well, radium is a weird element. And so radium probably involves the same unknown principles as things like carbon plus extra complications that explain why it's radioactive. So that's a really stupid thing to do. You're not going to learn anything that way. But in fact, it's by pursuing the oddballs that you get the breakthroughs that lead you to understand the things which are much more general about problems like underlying structure of, of what's going on in atoms in this case, or I think, probably, this is my guess, uh, the underlying structures of particle physics. So that's, I think, the strategy for understanding neutrinos and, and trying to understand neutrino mass. So we now come to the technical part of the talk. The next four slides are the most technical part of this talk. Uh, so if you want to take a nap, this is a good time to do it. I'll wake you up when they're done, this part. I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between Dirac mass and Majorana mass, in case you ever wanted to know that. So here's Dirac. Dirac was the guy that figured out that there should be such a thing as antiparticles and antimatter. Uh, he was absolutely right. And because of what he figured out, we now know that something like an electron uh, is what we call a Dirac particle. It has a Dirac mass. And in fact, to be more precise, an electron is really four particles. And it's four particles because of symmetries of, the, of the, uh, the principles of nature, the forces of nature. So it's four particles because it has two different spins that it can have. Electrons have spin that can come in two different varieties. So it has to have both, both of those spins have to have the same mass. That's required by a symmetry, a rotational symmetry of nature. And then you have to do, multiply it by two again to take into account that there's not just electrons, but also its antiparticle, the positron. So that's another two guys. And those guys, again, because of symmetry, which has to do with special relativity, uh, those guys all have to have the same mass. So whenever somebody tells you that something has a Dirac mass, what they really mean is that there's four particles. Those four particles have the same mass. They all go together, and you can't pull them apart and give them this different masses, or you break the symmetries of nature. Now, there's a caveat in this argument, which is that if you have a completely uncharged particle, if I had to have a neutrino that has no electric charge and no other kind of charge at all, then one possibility is that that particle, that neutrino, could actually be its own antiparticle. If it's its own antiparticle, then I don't have to multiply by two the second time in that argument that I gave you there. 
And so that, that sort of particle doesn't have to come four at a time. It can come two at a time. And this is what we call a Majorana particle. And another way of saying that is that if you had a particle that was a Dirac particle that came in four at a time, and you actually were able to give it mass in such a way uh, that you, you split it up without doing something bad uh, with particles and any particles, you could split it up into two kinds of particles, which we would then call Majorana particles, and those guys could have different masses. So this, what the suggestion here is that perhaps neutrinos uh, are not like the electron, which is a Dirac particle. There's some other kind of a particle, which we now call Majorana particles, and they come two at a time instead of four at a time, um, but they have some memory of the fact that they're related to the electron. After all, we produce them with electrons. And so they have some memory of this, flat, uh, of this fact, which is the fact that they're, they're actually kind of a split of what would have been a direct particle into two pairs. And one of them is heavier, and one of them is lighter. So if this idea is right, this idea is called the seesaw, the neutrinos that we know about are Majorana particles, not direct particles, and their mass is very small, and the reason that their mass is very small is because they have some partners that nobody's ever seen, which are also neutrinos, Majorana neutrinos, which are very heavy. In such a way that if you think of this as being, say, the electron mass, this is the electron mass, say, this is the neutrinos that we've seen, which are much lighter, and these are some neutrinos that we haven't seen that are much heavier, and that's the seesaw. So this is a theory idea. You could tell it's a theory idea. Uh, we don't know if it's right. If it's right, of course, it means that there are some other very heavy neutrinos that we haven't seen yet, but it's going to be very difficult to find them. In fact, they might be so heavy that we'll never be able to produce them in ordinary experiments, so that's not so great. But this is a possibility, at least, for why neutrinos have tiny mass. Well, this is related to another interesting question, which has to do with, as I was saying before, why there's more matter than antimatter in the universe. We think that the Big Bang should have produced the same amount of matter as antimatter. We don't know that for, for sure. It could be that there's some kind of funny initial condition. But we think that probably that's the case. And then you would have thought that the matter and the antimatter would have found themselves a long time ago. They would have annihilated, as you know, matter and antimatter does. And then you end up with a universe that looks like this, which is not the one that we live in. So what actually happened? What actually happened, we think, is that by some unknown process, in the early universe, there was some dynamical process, some thing that happened, some event that happened. And that event favored matter over antimatter a little bit by, say, one part in 10 billion. And it's just that little bit, that little bit of favoritism is the reason why we have enough matter left now to make stars and galaxies and everything that we see, including you. So that's the idea, and, and we're trying to figure out whether that idea is right and how that idea could possibly be right. Now, a physics way of talking about that, so you can't quite wake up from your nap yet, because there's one more piece of jargon there. The physics way of talking to that, about that has to do with something called CP symmetry. And this is just referring to the relation between particles and antiparticles. So the C in CP has to do with flipping the charge of a particle, because the antiparticle is the opposite charge of a particle. And the P here has to do with parity, and this has to do with, uh, it's a fancy way of talking about the spins of particles. Um, but basically what this means is that CP is, the, is a, a symmetry of nature that relates, say, a left-handed electron that's an le electron of a certain kind of spin to its antiparticle with a certain kind of spin, a right-handed positron. So if the world were a world in which all of the processes preserved this CP symmetry, then you would never get more matter than antimatter. You would always have the same amount. In order to get more matter than antimatter, there has to be some process that doesn't respect this CP symmetry that violates it uh, at least a little bit. Well, we actually know of something that does that. It involves quarks. In fact, this was a big surprise, one of the big surprise discoveries of particle physics. 1964, uh, by these guys, uh, Cronin and Fitch, they showed that a certain kind of process that involves quarks in, inside, uh, bound up in particles called kaons, they actually show that it favored matter over antimatter a little bit. Sounds good, right? That sounds like just the thing we need. And in fact, uh, this was very surprising. It was verified in a number of experiments. A different, slightly related uh, version of this CP, violation of CP symmetry was uh, verified at uh, Fermilab, uh, an observation that came somewhat later. So that was all good. And in fact, we kind of understand that CP violation in quarks. Uh, these two Japanese uh, physicists, Kobayashi and Mishikawa, uh, 
they were able to show that there's a relation between the fact that quark flavors mix. So quarks mix, just like neutrinos do. And their mixing, which again has to do with the way that they get mass by interacting with the, the Higgs uh, field, uh, they were able to show that there's a, a, a kind of a natural way that that process could produce uh, what's called CP violation. And they were even to write to, able to write down a parameter that's basically an angle here uh, whose value measures how much you favor matter over antimatter. And we now know that this is actually going on and the fact that, that quarks mix among each, each other is actually producing this CP violation and we've actually measured this parameter at 67 degrees. So they got a Nobel Prize for that. That was an important observation. And the only problem is that having measured the amount of CP violation in quarks, we know that it's not nearly enough to explain why there's more matter than antimatter as we see in our universe. It, it could explain a little of it, it's like less than a billionth or something, but it's not nearly enough. So what does that mean? Does it mean this is all nonsense? No, what this suggests, I think, and a lot of people think, is that this is the right idea, but you're looking at the wrong particles. And that the particles you should be looking at are neutrinos, because neutrinos also mix up, as neutrino oscillations show. So I can use the same argument that the Japanese physicists used, but now I'm gonna use it for neutrinos instead of quarks, and then it's possible that the neutrinos not only violate this symmetry of matter and antimatter, but they could do it by a larger amount than the quarks do. And that's the idea behind neutrinos in your existence. The fancy name for this is leptogenesis. And in fact, it's related to those Majorana thingies I was showing you in the technical part of this lecture. So I said if neutrinos were Majorana particles, that means they're their own antiparticles, then they have some very heavy partners that we don't know about because they're very heavy and hard to make. But those very heavy partners would have been made in the Big Bang. They would have decayed because they're unstable into ordinary matter. And in fact, it would be that process, the process of making heavy exotic neutrinos that decay into ordinary matter is the thing that produced ultimately all the stars and galaxies. So this we call leptogenesis because it is in some sense the genesis of matter. And that's the thing we'd like to know if it's correct. So, as a theorist, we like to make lots of stories, but physics is an experimental science, and now we'd like to know whether any of that is true. So that's pretty hard to figure out because this requires you to know an awful lot more about neutrinos than we've been able to do so far. So that gets me into the last part of my talk, which is the experimental talk part. How do you get more information about neutrinos? What do you have to do in order to get better understanding of neutrinos? And it's basically two things, you have to get a better source of neutrinos. So the sun was pretty good, but there's only so much you can do with that. Uh, atmospheric neutrinos are useful and we're, we're doing things with that. But what you really want are controlled powerful beams of neutrinos coming from something like an accelerator. And then the second thing you want is you want bigger and better neutrino detectors. So neutrino beams from accelerators, well, we know how to do that. So here's Fermilab. Uh, this is an accelerator, it's actually underground here, but there's always a road that goes around. And that accelerator uh, produces uh, neutrinos. In fact, we produce from that what are currently the world's most powerful neutrino beams. And we have plans to do even better and at least quadruple the power of the neutrino beams that we make. You might ask, how do you make a neutrino beam? That sounds hard. Uh, and the answer is you do it in kind of a crude way, but, but we're getting better at it as, as time goes on. You first make a proton beam. That's an easy thing to do because a proton is a charged particle. And and ordinary stuff is made out of protons. You smash those protons into something else that we call a target. That produces lots of other unstable particles. You let them go for a long ways and uh, they get, some of them get absorbed and some of them decay. And by the time you get down here, uh, only the, basically the only ones that are left are those particles called muons. And then the muons eventually decay and their decays produce one particular kind of neutrino called the muon neutrino. So this is, uh, it's not really producing neutrino beams, it's producing a beam of everything, but of the everything, by the time you get to here, the only thing that actually comes out is a beam of neutrinos. So that at least makes that sound pretty easy. So what are we doing at the moment? Well, we have a powerful neutrino beam, so what do we do? We shoot it somewhere, and at the moment we are shooting it to Minnesota. So here's Chicago, uh, there's northern Minnesota. We shoot it about 500 miles. Of course, neutrino beams go straight and they go right through the Earth. So we, we don't do it that way. It, we do it this way. It goes straight through the Earth. There's no tunnel or anything there. It just goes right through the Earth. And it ends up in Minnesota. 
and ends up where two detectors are. One of them is called Minos, which is a detector that's in a mine. It's in what's called the Sudan mine in Minnesota. And the other one is called Nova, which is a larger, newer detector, which is actually not in a mine. It's, it's above ground uh, at a, in a building, basically, in northern Minnesota. So you produce the neutrinos at Fermilab. You shoot them towards Minnesota. One four hundredth of a second later, you have a chance that some of them are detected in one of these giant detectors. So here's Nova. That's the newest one. We've just turned it on. It's just starting to take data. It's really exciting. This is about a 20,000 ton detector. It's made out of, of plastic and liquid scintillator. It's a fancy material you can use to detect things. Uh, it's, we're very excited about this. We're going to run this for at least five or six years and see what we can learn about neutrinos by shooting them to Minnesota. Uh, here's an example of one of the first events. This, this is kind of complicated. So here's when you, a, a, a neutrino actually interacts with the detector, what does it do? It makes sort of a splash. And then you have to figure out as a physicist what the splash means. Um, but that's why these people get paid large quantities of money to figure that out. So I could say more about NOVA, but I want to get on a little bit to the future in the last few minutes of this talk. Future is always interesting. So what are we going to do beyond that? That's sort of the next five years. What do we want to do beyond that? Well, when physicists want to do something, the first thing to do is make a committee. And then the committee spawns other committees. And then eventually, you get enough committees together that they come to some sort of consensus. And we did one of those exercises recently. And the, the AP likes to make catchy headlines. Their headline of this result was physics panel to feds beam us up some neutrinos. So what was that about? Well, it's going back to Ray Davis. It's going back to the scene of the crime, to the golden opportunity of making use of the fact that the Homestake mine is there in South Dakota. And we want to use that as the next staging ground for doing neutrinos. So why do we want to do that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is it's farther away, which is good for doing neutrino oscillations, because neutrino oscillations care about how far away things are. So instead of 500 miles, it's about 800 miles to South Dakota, to the Black Hills there. <coughs> of course, it means you have to point your neutrino beam in a different direction, which is not so easy. You can't just move it. You have to make a new neutrino beam. The other reason we want to do it is because in South Dakota, there is a big underground laboratory, brand new. So this is what it looked like when Ray Davis had his tank there. It was a working mine, and they just gave him some space, and they said, go ahead, stick your tank there uh, inside the working mine. It's no longer a working mine. The mine is now uh, being run by uh, the combination of the Department of Energy, uh, the state of South Dakota, and a very generous private donor, Mr. Stanford, who has allowed them to make this beautiful, uh, brand new underground laboratory. This is uh, 4,800 feet underground. Doesn't look like a mine, does it? You know, it looks like I, I, you know, I'd like to live in an apartment that nice shiny floors and <coughs> new fixtures and all that. So brand new underground laboratory, 4,800 feet underground, uh, just waiting for something good to go in there. So that's good. What else would we like to do? Well, we'd like to have a bigger detector and a better detector. So the bigger is just a question of money. The better is a question of technology. I, I told you that the biggest neutrino detector that we have at the moment is in Japan, and it's 50,000 tons of water. So can I do better than water as a neutrino detector? Well, you would imagine so, right? So here's something that's better than water. It's called liquid argon. It's a beautiful neutrino detector, because when the neutrino interacts with the material, you get these things that particle physics loves, which are these tracks from which you can figure out what the particles are and what the momenta are and what they're doing. And you can really identify all the physics that's going on here instead of just getting a, something that looks like a random splash of garbage. So we love liquid argon. It's the greatest thing ever. It's a little bit more expensive to make uh, 50,000 tons of liquid argon because, you for one thing, you have to cool it down to 303 degrees below zero in order for it to work like this. So that's a little trickier. And then you have to have some kind of instrumentation to, to get those nice tracks. But that's the basic idea, use a better technology. So we're developing liquid argon detectors from neutrinos right now at Fermilab. Here's a picture that was taken about a week ago. Uh, this is Bonnie Fleming, who is the spokesperson of the microboon experiment. Uh, she is actually, we are all, all of us, in fact, are standing on top of her detector called microboon. This is about a 200 ton liquid argon detector at Fermilab. And it's part of sort of a staging of getting to understand this technology better uh, so that you can get from 200 ton neutrino detectors to 50,000 ton neutrino detectors. But that's the way you have to do this. The technology is very challenging. You have to do these things in stages. But we're doing that. And this is the kind of thing we want to get to pretty soon. 
It's something like a 50,000 ton liquid argon detector. We think we know how to build this, but by the time you get to 50,000 ton liquid argon detectors, you better get a lot of people together and figure out what is the best way to build such things. Uh, if you think, for example, about how we found the Higgs boson, that was a world collaboration of the best physicists all around the world figuring out how to build a detector, a huge detector that could see the Higgs boson. This is the same thing. We're putting together an international collaboration right now, which is gonna try and figure out what's the right way to make a 50,000 ton detector or what is the thing we should do? Maybe it should be two detectors or a different technology. So we're trying to figure all that now with a collaboration that involves the whole world of physics. So, but that's our ambition. And then in the end, we're gonna get something we hope that looks kind of like this. So we're gonna build a new neutrino beam at Fermilab that's more powerful and is pointing the right direction to get to South Dakota. So that's a challenge. Uh, we'll have some other smaller detectors uh, at on-site at Fermilab. And then way over here in South Dakota, we're gonna build whatever this brand new detector is that's gonna tell us lots of new things. So that's the basic idea. What are we gonna try and do? Well, I already told you a little bit about this. One of the big items is we're gonna try and figure out whether neutrinos actually violate this CP symmetry of between matter and antimatter. I think if, we, if the only thing we do is that, that's great. That's gonna give us a big clue about what the origin of matter is. It's not by itself enough to figure out whether there's something like leptogenesis, but it would certainly be a big clue. We're gonna measure lots of other things about neutrinos that are gonna test whether our current understanding is right or, or screwed up. Uh, given all the surprises we've had in the past, I certainly expect more surprises uh, when we get better experiments like this. And then there's a couple other things that you kind of get for free. Once you have this big detector underground, it turns out there's other things you can do without really adding any more money to your experiment. One is you can do neutrino astronomy. In particular, you can look for neutrinos coming from supernovas. Remember we said that was one of the sources of neutrinos. And you can do something that has nothing to do with neutrinos, which is you can look for proton decay. That was the, actually the original thing that other Japanese detector was built for. They haven't seen any proton decay. The, as far as they can tell, ordinary matter made from protons is, is stable and never decays. Um, but it, maybe if you build a better detector, a bigger detector, or you wait longer, maybe you'll actually see proton decay someday. Let me just close with a few items about uh, the supernova neutrinos, because I think they're cool. So supernovas are big explosions. Uh, this one, which happened in the year 1054, was noticed by people with the naked eye because it was quite, it was fairly uh, close by. This is what it looks like now. That's the, what's left of the explosion. And there's a, a neutron star of uh, a particular kind called a pulsar in the middle of that thing. Uh, people have now figured out how to do simulations of supernova explosions. This took a long time. It was actually until fairly recently the simulations that people did of supernova explosions had the, uh, the deficiency that they didn't actually explode. And this is for a complicated physics reason that it's actually hard to make supernovas explode. And it turns out that, in, that one of the things they need to explode is they need neutrinos. They need, they need to be able to get their energy out in the form of neutrinos to actually explode. So neutrinos are not just a detail of supernova. They're really bound up in the whole idea of this complicated physics of making an exploding star which then produces these, these uh, also remarkable neutron star remnants uh, like these pulsars. So this is physics that everybody wants to understand and then involves neutrinos in a very extreme way. Now, how often do you get a supernova? Well, we don't really know. Uh, some of you may have heard that this famous star in Orion is, is ready to go, could go tomorrow. It could have gone tonight uh, for all I know. Um, but you can't really count on any particular star. Fortunately, there's a lot of stars out there and some of them are gonna go. And in fact, we already have a supernova early warning system. And this early warning system is quite interesting. It's based on the fact that when a supernova goes, we will actually see the neutrino signal before we see the light signal. The neutrinos get, there, get to us first. So we actually have an early warning system that involves the neutrino detectors around the world that exist now and the idea is that if there is a supernova that happens now, we'll actually be able to give enough warning to the optical astronomers. They'll be able to point the optical telescopes in the right place right when the supernova light signal starts to happen, which I think is a very cool thing. Um, so again, that doesn't tell you how long you have to wait. You might have to wait a year, 10 years, 30 years, 40 years. But as the famous astronomer William Herschel pointed out in 1813, the sky is full of ghosts. What did he mean by that? He was uh, really the, the guy that invented modern astronomy and he, he first realized two very important things. 
One, he realized that the stars he was looking at through his telescope, in, because the speed of light was finite, which is something he knew, uh, the light coming from those stars, some of them, was millions of years old. So that meant he was looking at images that were millions of years old. And the other thing that he knew, which he's the first person to actually think about this, was that stars have, they evolve, they have a lifetime. They're born, and then they live a while, and then they die. So you put those two things together, and he realized that the, some of the stars that he was looking at in his telescope were already dead, and that he was seeing their ghosts in the sky. So he didn't know about supernovas, but he had exactly the right idea that the sky is full of ghosts. And in fact, if you do the math, uh, the other side of the Milky Way galaxy is 65 light centuries away, so that's a long ways. And in fact, neutrinos from on the order of 2,000 supernova have already happened. The supernova have already exploded, and the neutrinos are already on their way here. It's just a question of when the first bunch gets to us. So by building these big neutrino detectors, it's, it's a bonus that we're actually going to be able to see uh, all of that neutrino signal. So that is basically what I wanted to tell you. I thought since I started with poetry, I would end with poetry. So I started with poetry written by a novelist, and I'm going to end with some poetic statements that were written by physicists who are not generally known for their poetic statements. But these two guys, in addition to being good at everything else, were also good at making poetic statements. So the first guy said, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore. In fact, he goes on to talk about rattling shells in his ear whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. So Isaac Newton was very aware of the fact that even though he had figured out a whole bunch of important things, that he really was just a fingernail scratching the surface of what was out there. And of course, Einstein understood this completely, and he has this uh, interesting statement about, uh, one cannot help but be in awe contemplating the mysteries of eternity of life and the marvelous structure of reality. I think it's a nice way to describe physics, the marvelous structure of reality. It's enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. And I think that's one of the things when we think about the reasons why we do this basic science, there's lots of reasons why we do it, but I think a lot of it just has to do with the importance of mystery, of trying to understand the mystery of existence. So that's uh, all I have to tell you. If, uh, if you're ever in the Chicago area, you should come visit us at Fermilab. Uh, this is what it looks like. We have uh, a high-rise building. We have uh, a guest house, which is called Aspen East, because of our long history, our traditional history with the Aspen Physics Center. Um, we have lots of a Aspen connections there. Um, and I'd like to thank all the physicists that I stole slides from for this talk. And that's it. Thank you. Support for this grassroots community television program comes from U.S. Trust. From wealth structuring to investment management, U.S. Trust's global perspective, unique team approach, fiduciary platform, and more than 200 years of experience provide for the kind of insights, solutions, and expertise that have a worth all their own. Mm -hmm.